Praise the Lord. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Andrew, Esther, Miriam, and Sanjay for uh, joining class on time. Uh, this morning, we don't have our uh, in-person students. They've gone for a mission trip to Mangalore. They're ministering in Mangalore. So it'll just be uh, the online students. I also like to welcome our e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture uh, later on. Um, so just a couple of things before we begin today's class, because we don't have our in-person students. So I would request good participation from our online students. Uh, so please, um, you know, read uh, the scripture passages and, you know, uh, participate in the discussions. And, uh, uh, and if there's any questions, you can, yes, feel free to uh, share your uh, thoughts and your answers. Uh, the other thing is I'm uh, teaching from home today. I'm taking class from home today. Our uh, UPS is uh, giving us a little trouble. So in case there's, uh, you know, the power goes off, then uh, you just have to give me a couple of minutes. I'll try to log in through my uh, phone. So uh, just those little things. But I'm just praying for supernatural favor and that we'll have power throughout the class today. Okay, so let's begin. Um, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Any of our online students can lead us in prayer, please? Warren? Oh, yeah. sorry. No, please, any, any, anyone, anyone. Okay, I'll, I'll go. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise the Lord for the wonderful God you are. Thank you for this beautiful day that we uh, that lies before us. Thank you for uh, this lesson that we are about to uh, comments today where we will learn more about you more about uh, uh your what you what you are lord and we ask you that we retain everything and we uh uh take it we keep in mind what what this means to us today we ask you to anoint uh, and bless our teacher and every student here that we have we will listen with active here ears and uh, and a good heart uh, we commend this lesson in, into your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Warren James. Uh, so we are studying Chapter 10, uh, Christ's Substitutionary Suffering. We began looking at this lesson on Tuesday. So uh, basically, when we talk about Christ's Substitutionary Suffering, we're, we're saying that he took our place. Uh, he bore our sins, he took upon himself our grief, uh, he carried our sorrows, he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our uh, iniquities, and he, uh, you know, uh, took on uh, death or he paid the price for uh, the consequences for our sin, which is uh, death. He tasted death for every man. And so we see that on the cross, when Jesus uh, died, he took our place. Uh, he did what we should have done. Uh, he bore what we should have borne. He suffered for what we should have suffered. And uh, he paid for what we should have paid for our sins. So um, the primary aspect of uh, a substitutionary sacrifice is that the one who is making the sacrifice, you know, fully identifies uh, with the one on whose behalf the sacrifice is made. So that is why we, another reason why uh, Jesus had to be fully human was because he was going to take our place. He was going to make the sacrifice for our sins. He was taking upon himself the consequences for our sins, which is death. So he was doing it on behalf of us, which means he had to, you know, identify uh, in our place. And that's why he, you know, he had to be fully human in every sense. We also um, studied uh, last class that uh, he did this for us. Uh, and we studied in detail, uh, a little bit in detail. Uh, we looked at Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 to 6. And then we also saw that, you know, he did it out of uh, love. And we ended last class by looking at Romans chapter 4, verse 25. We basically um, uh, studied this verse in detail where it says he was delivered up for our because of our offenses and he was raised because of our 
uh, justification. So we looked at what it meant uh, to say that Jesus was delivered up for our offenses and he was raised because of our justification. We'll move on. Um, before we move on, does anyone have any questions, any doubts? Okay, I'll take the silence for a no and we'll move on to looking at uh, 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 even more uh, different aspects of uh, what uh, Christ substitutionary suffering is all about. Okay. Um, First Peter chapter 2 verse 24 uh, says that he bore our sins in his body. Okay. So can one of you please read First Peter chapter 2 verse 24 please himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sin might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed amen thank you lucy so here it says that he bore our sins in his own body okay which means that uh, you know he bore uh, the misdeeds that we had done and he endured the consequences for our sins which we should have endured now he bore our sins is basically uh, uh, you know pointing back or reflecting back to him being the sin bearer the offering that was uh, made uh, by the sin bearer he was our, as a substitute in our place he was bearing our sins so he was our sin bearer and if you remember that um, I explained to you on the Day of Atonement, the priest would take two lambs. One lamb was the sin offering and the other lamb was the sin bearer. The sin offering was, this, uh, was the lamb that was sacrificed and the blood was sprinkled um, in the Holy of Holies in between uh, the two uh, cherubims, which was uh, the seat of mercy. And also we see that the other lamb where uh, the, the priest would lay his hands on that lamb, it became the lamb that was a sin bearer. It bore the sins of the entire Israelite race and that, that lamb was sent out into the wilderness. So here Jesus identifying again with um, uh, uh, you know the Old Testament sacrifice. He was our sin bearer. He bore our sins is basically talking about the uh, uh, the, the lamb that bore uh, the sins of the entire Israelite race. And also here we see that, you know, uh, uh, when he bore our sins, he provided for our healing. Because we read here in this verse in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, whose stripes we were healed. Okay. <clears throat> Now we need to uh, uh, note in this um, verse what is the result of Christ's substitutionary suffering. You know, um, it says here that we having died to sin might live for righteousness. Okay, so it's basically, uh, uh, you know, Peter uh, saying here that, you know, that we need to lay aside our sin and live a life of righteousness, which means he's saying that we no longer operate in our sinful nature because on the cross, Jesus, um, you know, broke the power of sin. He canceled the power of sin, of Satan and of death. Um, sin, like Paul writes in Romans, sin has no longer, you know, authority and power over us. We are dead to sin. And, um, uh, you know, uh, so here it says that, you know, uh, since that we are dead to sin and sin has no longer po uh, uh, any power in us. Um, and when we are born again, we no longer operate in the old sinful nature because now we have the nature of Christ. And that is why uh, Paul says that we are a new creation, <coughs> which means that, you know, when Christ has done all this on the cross, you know, uh, Peter is writing and saying that we need to come to a place where we are laying aside our sin, that uh, we are no longer slaves to sin because we are dead to sin. The power of sin over us is cancelled, is nullified, and uh, hence we need to live a life of righteousness because of what Christ has done on the cross 
that uh, you know he has made us in right standing with God. His Christ righteousness has been imputed or been put into our account, so to say. <clears throat> So here it says that we having died to sin might live for righteousness. Basically, Peter is reminding us that when Jesus died on the cross, you know, we are also dead to uh, sin, uh, which means our life is permanently changed by our new identification with Jesus on the cross. And, uh, you know, uh, 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 Paul, the Apostle Paul, very beautifully uh, describes this in Romans chapter 6, where he speaks of this as our spiritual identification. Uh, he says that, and even in Colossians chapter 2, verse uh, 12, it talks about that having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also were raised with him to your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So Paul... <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry. So Paul is basically talking about our spiritual uh, identification. Uh, he's uh, basically saying that we spiritually identify our, our, our new identification that when, when we are born again um, is that we spiritually identify uh, with Christ. You know, uh, not only that, uh, you know, that uh, we are already in Christ, uh, that we are in him, um, we were, but we also identify with his death, that is his crucifixion. We identify with his burial. We identify with his resurrection, with his ascension and his uh, seating in the heavenly places. And Paul says this is our new spiritual identification he also writes about this in colossians chapter 2 verse 12 you know um and first corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 can somebody read first uh, corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 someone else can read first corinthians chapter 6 verse 17 and someone else can read first corinthians chapter 12 verse 13 please anyone can read first corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 1 Corinthians is one thirty, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Amen. Thank you, Sanjay. So it says we are in Christ. Okay, he talks about our spiritual identification that we are already in Christ. Uh, let's read First Corinthians chapter six, verse seventeen, please. Someone can read that. But the person who is united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Amen. So here, thank you, Esther Clement. Here says, we are in him. Uh, we are spiritually one with him. Okay. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Do all have gifts of healing? Sorry, all... it's, uh, sorry, Angeline. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. 13, I'm sorry. First Corinthians, first Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one spirit we all are baptized into one body, whether Greek, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and all have been made to drink into one spirit. Amen. Thank you, Angeline Mercy. So here we see that the Holy Spirit puts us in to Christ. So, you know, uh, when we are born again, you know, uh, God brought us into Christ. We read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, when we are born again, we are in him, you know, spiritually one with him, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, we read that the Holy Spirit put us in Christ. So spiritually, you know, our identification is that we are already in uh, Christ. Uh, we are already in him. But, uh, you know, Paul is writing very elaborately and mentioning in Romans chapter 6 that, you know, we uh, identify with, uh, spiritually identify with Christ. That is our new identity identity our spiritual identity or our spiritual identification so what is our spiritual identification that we identify with christ's death his resurrection 
his burial, his resurrection, uh, uh, his ascension, his seating. This is our spiritual identification. Uh, and note, this is not physical identification, not physically happening, but this is our spiritual identification. So spiritually, how do, how do we identify with Christ's death or how do we identify with Christ's uh, crucifixion? Uh, you know, when Christ died, we died with him, uh, the, the, which means the old sinful nature, uh, which uh, Paul mentions in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, he says, the old man was crucified with him, uh, which means that we no longer have uh, an old sinful nature inside us. We are now partakers of the divine nature, as we read in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. And the power of sin over our lives has been broken, and we are no longer slaves of uh, sin, as we read in Romans chapter 6, verse 14. So if you want to understand the doctrine of, um, of justification, of um, of uh, sin and salvation, you can read Romans chapter uh, 6, 7, and 8, very powerful uh, chapters. Okay, so here, how do we I spiritually identify with Christ's crucifixion? Is that we no longer have our old sinful nature inside us, now we are partakers of the divine nature as we read in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, and the power of sin over our lives has been broken, and we are no longer slaves of sin. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 14. If you notice, um, uh, these, what I've just been sharing is not in your notes, so maybe you want to take down notes for yourself, it's, it's fine. Uh, so how do we identify with Christ's uh, burial? How do we spiritually identify in his burial? Is when Christ was buried, we were also buried. This means that you know, when a person dies and they're buried, they're basically separated from their old life. So we are separated from our old life. The old has gone, the new has come, and uh, we are a new creation, and uh, the old has no more claim over us or any part in us, as we read in Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. So we are a new creature now, and uh, even as a person dies and is buried, they're separated from their old life. The old life has no more claims over them. So no one can come over their grave and say, hey, you know, you, borry, you borrowed uh, 10 lakhs for me. You have to give me back. You know, they're totally separated from their old life. The old life has no more claim over uh, us or has any part in us. Okay. Uh, the next one is how do we identify spiritually with his resurrection? So we looked at how we spiritually identify with Christ's death, his crucifixion, uh, with his burial. Now, how do we spiritually identify with his resurrection? When Christ was resurrected, which means we were also raised up with him. Uh, we read this, uh, Paul writes about this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. I'm just... Uh, Quoting these references, you can take time later on to read. Uh, this means that, you know, we were bought, uh, brought from death to life and the power of Satan, um, uh, and, and we were brought out of the power of Satan into the power of God, as we read in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. And now we walk in a newness of life, in, in the God kind of life, the Zoe life, the eternal life uh, that, uh, that Jesus uh, bought for us on the cross where he took the divine exchange. He took upon himself our death so that we can experience uh, the eternal life, the fullness of life. And so how do we identify with his resurrection is that, you know, we are brought out of death to eternal life. We are brought out of the power of Satan from being uh, slaves of Satan, slave of death, slave of uh, sin. Um, and now we are uh, into God. We are children of God. And now we walk in this new life in the kingdom of God. And we have a new way of living. And the power of darknesses have no hold over us. Amen. Uh, such powerful truths. 
uh, that Paul presents in uh, Romans chapter 6. And of course, he meant, talks about this in, in his other epistles as well. Uh, so we looked at how we identify spiritually with Christ's uh, death, his crucifixion, his burial, uh, his resurrection. Now, how do we identify spiritually with his um, ascension? Uh, when Christ ascended, we also ascended with him. How do we know this? Uh, we read this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, and Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Uh, so what does it mean that, you know, when Christ ascended, we also ascended with him? Uh, it means that now we set our affections on things above because now we are ascended with Christ, uh, with him above. So we don't set our affections uh, as we used to in our you know, in our past sinful life and we were living in sin, in the bondage of sin, when our affections were for the things of the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. But now we set our affections on things above. Uh, and also we live with a renewed mind. Uh, so what is a renewed mind? A renewed mind is basically... Um, thinking the thoughts of God and taking on the ways of God. Because um, uh, God said, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. So basically, when we talk about a renewed mind, we are talking about taking on the thoughts of God and taking on the ways of uh, God. Okay, so we live with a renewed mind and uh, we look at everything from heaven's perspective because we have ascended to heaven. We basically now, we're no longer uh, earthly citizens. Our citizenship is in heaven. Uh, we are sons and daughters of uh, God. Uh, we have a heavenly citizen, a heavenly passport, so to say. Uh, so we look at life from heaven's uh, perspective, uh, which means, you know, when even though we are living here on earth, we... Uh, we look at earthly things more with a heavenly perspective. We look at our identity as who we are in Christ, what Christ has done for us. We look at sin, sickness, pain, uh, suffering with a heavenly perspective, uh, with what Christ has finished for us on the cross and what he has done, and we walk in that. So we we have to walk or live with a renewed mind and look at everything from a very uh, heavenly perspective of how uh, Christ would look at it, how God would look at it. We need to look at it. And um, our life is now hidden in Christ Jesus. Um, uh, we have um, his spiritual covering. We have uh, uh, you know, his protection over us and uh, we uh, are inheritors of uh, Christ's blessing. Our inheritance is in Christ and we are, uh, uh, you know, sons and daughters of the kingdom of God and he has given us the keys of authority. And then the last one is we identify in his seating. So how do we identify with Christ being seated at the right hand of God? Basically, when we talk about the right hand, it basically is talking of a place of authority, a place where, um, you know, of power. So when Christ was seated on the throne at the right hand of the Father, we also spiritually identify with him when we are born again. Now we are seated at the right hand of uh, God as we read in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. Again, Ephesians chapter 2 is a very powerful uh, chapter. It basically talks about our spiritual uh, inheritance, our spiritual blessings. So a good chapter to uh, uh, read, meditate, and to just, you know, make that part of your uh you know, the very core of your uh, uh, fiber of your being, uh, because that is what we uh, have inherited, our spiritual inheritance, our spiritual blessing. And it says that, you know, we are seated with Christ in authority and we are in a place of authority and dominion in Christ Jesus. And uh, which means we are in authority over every uh, power of Satan, over every demonic Hosts and all the power of Satan and all um, the demonic hosts are underneath our feet. Amen. 
So this is our spiritual identification, which Paul very beautifully, um, uh, you know, brings um, uh, to our notice. Of course, with uh, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's talking about our spiritual identification, which he talks about in the book of Colossians, Ephesians as well, and uh, in Romans chapter 6. Uh, any questions? on our spiritual identification, any doubts? Anything you want me to clarify or repeat or explain again? Sister, if you can explain a little bit on uh, looking at things in our life in a heavenly perspective across our various realms in our life so once we have that perspective i'm sure uh, how we look at things changes so uh, can you can you throw some light on that uh, sure so for example uh, you know uh, maybe when uh, in the past we've had a lot of failures um, uh, you know we've uh, not achieved things uh, we we feel that we can't when whenever we do something it ends up in a failure but uh, when we are in Christ and we are seated now with Christ in the heavenly places you know we look at our lives in 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 that perspective in the sense that you know we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us and uh, that you know uh, uh, you know God has. Uh, planned even before the foundations of the world he has um, uh, plans and purposes for us and his plans and purposes like it says in jeremiah uh, is not to harm us uh, but is to prosper us and give us a, a, a future so we step into god's plans and purposes and we think that you know the things that we were doing in the past uh, you know, were not God's plans and purposes for our lives, or maybe we did not do it with uh, the Spirit's leading because we were living in our own sinful nature, we were doing it uh, uh, in our fallen human nature, we were doing it with, um, uh, you know, uh, not with the strength of God, the wisdom of God. And so now we come to a place where we uh, receive wisdom, we receive strength, we receive the Spirit's guidance and leading, um, and we step into that with a sense of, uh, uh, not the sense of failure, but with a sense of assurance that, you know, this is God's plan and purpose for us, and He's going to lead me through this, and I'm going to be victorious in this. So even if it is the enemy that is coming against us and causing failure and close doors and hurdles, then we know our spiritual identification that, uh, you know, that we have authority over every demonic powers uh, and, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, that the powers of darkness have no hold over us. So we speak against those uh, uh, powers of darkness because God has given us everything that we need for, uh, uh, for godliness and life. And then we step ahead in that. Um, or if you are, uh, uh, you know, if you are living with this whole fear that, you know, there's a curse in your family and you have seen uh, things happening in a cycle or a pattern, uh, but you don't believe that now you break that and you say you take authority because God has given you the keys of authority and you have authority over the powers of darkness, over every demonic uh, uh, forces. Uh, every curse has been nullified. Uh, Jesus took our curse so that we can receive his blessing. And so you speak uh, the, the verses in the Bible that talk about, you know, your blessings in that area. You declare it and you stand in faith and you believe in faith and you declare in faith till you see God's word come true, till you see his promises come true, till his promises are a yes and an amen. So I've basically just given you two areas. Does that help uh, Esther Clement? Yes, sister. It's a very powerful key, uh, whether it is a failure or uh... Uh, these curses like we need to confess and take the place as if uh, we are in authority uh, through the heavenly perspective rather than uh, being worried uh, looking at the circumstances because we lose the battles in the mind itself so yes so it was true. very powerful key sister thank you 
uh, thank you, Ste uh, Esther. So here also, uh, you know, uh, something that we face is um, uh, uh, health, health issues. So the doctor can, uh, you know, uh, uh, diagnose us with certain sicknesses, health issues, and can say okay, this is for life. But, you know, we look at it from a heavenly perspective, that there is no sickness in heaven and on the cross Jesus is born our uh, griefs and carried our sorrows and we saw uh, grief uh, last uh, w uh, last class we saw grief the hebrew word is uh, sickness he carried our pain and so even though we take the treatment we take the medicines but we declare uh, God's word, we uh, speak God's word on healing, we declare the finished work of the cross and what Christ has done, what he's purchased for us, uh, which is so powerful, and we declare that over our bodies, over our lives, over those organs, and uh, we just um, believe that in faith and stand in faith till we see healing happen. Yes. Uh, to get through you, I thought you I saw your hand up. Yes, sister. Actually, uh, I wanted to ask a question, but you answered uh, kind of, you know, the. I wanted to ask you is that uh, when we st we are in the carnal world, so we are not uh, pure to, I mean, uh, clean to stand in the presence of God. So I wanted to ask you that we take uh, the, where the um, uh, weapons of warfare and prepare ourselves and then take the authority. That was my question. Uh, when we become children of God, we already yeah. have all of these. It's like a gift package that we receive. All of yeah. this comes to us. But yes, we need to know what we have received and we need to appropriate that in our lives and that we need to uh, know uh, what we have uh, received and use it and um, you know press until we see uh, victory in that area because uh, Jesus is the captain of our salvation he's already won the victory uh, he's already done that in the spiritual realm we need to do that here for ourselves and just uh, uh, press until we see victory okay thank you sister thank you anyone else has any questions any doubts Okay, so coming back to First um, uh, Peter um, chapter two, verse twenty-four, where it says, you know, we have uh, where Peter is saying we have died to sins. Uh, in a sense, we already look at our spiritual identification and what it really means. Um, but when he says when we have died to sin, in a sense that you know our debt to sin and guilt was paid by uh, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross so when we die to sin uh, you know uh, spiritually identifying with jesus is dead on the cross it means that he paid our debts so we don't uh, trouble ourselves over debts that are paid right um, once your debt is paid you don't keep worrying about it uh, you are free you are actually happy hey that's paid that's done it's the closure has come you know and so you don't trouble yourself over it so you know uh, when we look at what Christ has purchased for our, us on the cross, he's paid the debts for our sins. So we don't take the trouble, uh, you know, uh, ourselves over the debts that are already being paid because he bore our sins in his own body on the tree, uh, which means he took all of our debts and he paid them for me. And now I am dead to those debts. Okay. And which means th those debts have no power over uh, me and I'm hence I am dead to uh, sin. So you know, um, Paul says he writes about this in Romans chapter uh, uh, six, seven, and then he says, uh, you know, yes, we are dead to sin, but then why is sin still reigning in my mortal body? You know, I don't want to do certain things, but why do I end up? doing those things and then he very beautifully you know talks about uh, the work of the holy spirit in uh, chapter 8 and he says it's the holy spirit that uh, uh, empowers us uh, so you know yes we are dead to sin we need to keep this truth uh, and know that sin has no reign over our bodies and our minds and our and our spirit uh, you know not saying that hey i gave into temptation because you know it was more powerful than 
I am, that's a lie of the enemy. We are more powerful than the enemy uh, over every temptation. And that is why Christ, uh, you know, was able to overcome uh, uh, temptation was because he lived with this spiritual truth or this identification of who he was in the uh, Father. So it's very important to know who we are in Christ and very important to know what Christ has finished for us on the cross and to live that um, out. So, you know, uh, we're dead to sin because Christ suffered in my place, in our place, and we have nothing to do with sin or the, uh, or the, uh, or the, uh, the consequences of uh, sin, okay? Um, and he's taken them all away just as if we never committed it. So. That is why, you know, we are justified in Christ. Justification uh, uh, means that, you know, God looks at us just as if we never sinned. Amen. Uh, such powerful truths. Uh, and I hope this has really encouraged you and you know, brought these truths to light. And it's important that we live and walk in this uh, truth. And also here uh, in First Peter chapter 2, we read that whose uh, stripes you were healed. So which means, you know, uh, uh, on the cross, Jesus brought our total healing and our total wholeness in our um, in our soul, in our spirit, and in our body. Amen. So we are all. It's uh, and I love this. It says, "By whose stripes you were healed," which means it's not that you will be healed. You may be healed. You can be healed. It's not a possibility can happen or not, but it says you were healed, which means it's already a done thing. You're already healed. So, you know, any sickness that is uh, ravaging your body, any sickness that is bothering you, you just declare over it that you're already healed uh, through the stripes of Jesus and what Jesus done on the cross, and you just believe that and walk in it. But having said that, uh, please don't say that, you know, I'm going to stop treatment or you know, I'm not st I'm stopping to take medications. No, unless the doctor tells you, unless you hear from the Holy Spirit of God directly, then you go and uh, do that. Okay. So that is First um, uh, Peter chapter two, verse um, twenty-four. Just uh, two lines, but so powerful. There's such a powerful truth that we could uh, learn from that. Uh, any questions? Any doubts? Anyone else has any clarification? Before we move on, okay, uh, we'll move on. He became sin for us. Okay, we're looking at another aspect of Christ's substitutionary suffering. Uh, can one of you please read Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty-one, please? Second Corinthians chapter five, twenty-one. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Gertrude. So here is, uh, we know that Christ was sinless, but yet for our sakes, you know, he became uh, sin or he was made to become sin. And he became who, uh, you know, we were. He became a sinful like we were. Uh, and he took upon himself our sins, our, our, our curse, our shame, our guilt. And uh, he made us what he was. Okay. So he took upon himself what we were so that we can enjoy or we can become who he is. So in essence, Christ's substitutionary suffering is, uh, you know, what uh, we can, what we read in Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, where he says, though uh, he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, which means that he entered uh, into our experience so that we, through his uh, poverty, you know, could become rich. You know, he took our poverty so that we can become rich like him. Uh, so even though he was rich, yet for our sakes became poor, so we who are poor can become uh, rich uh, or receive the richness or the inheritance or the blessings 
uh, that are in Christ Jesus. And oh, we looked at the divine exchange that took place on the cross. We studied about this in the end of chapter uh, 7, so I'm not going to repeat that again. Uh, we'll move on uh, to another aspect of Christ's substitutionary suffering. He took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Um, We've already, uh, uh, I've already mentioned and spoken about this, but we will just look at it in a, in a little different uh, uh, way. Uh, let's read Matthew chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, please. We, uh, we read in Isaiah uh, chapter 53, verses 4 to 6 uh, last week, uh, in, in verse 5, basically, that he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of, for our peace was upon him, and by by his stripes we are healed. So uh, we read Matthew chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, where, um, uh, you know, Matthew quotes uh, uh, prophet Isaiah, what he mentions in Isaiah chapter 53. So can somebody read that, please? Matthew 8, 16 and 17. Matthew 8, 16 and 17. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Amen. So here Isaiah spoke prophetically about what Christ would accomplish on the cross, that he would take our, all our sicknesses, our disease, he would bear our sicknesses uh, in his uh, body. And... Uh, so here, you know, when uh, Matthew uh, uh, is writing this in his gospel, he's quoting Isaiah chapter 53, verse, uh, uh, verse 4 and 5. And uh, he's, uh, you know, uh, basically saying that, uh, you know, this has come into fulfillment. But, uh, you know, uh, we can't take it that, you know, uh, Isaiah, what he prophesied was... Uh, was just for that event. What was uh, what was mentioned in uh, in uh, Matthew chapter eight, verses sixteen and seventeen, when Jesus was going to heal the demon possessed man, or it's not uh, Isaiah just prophetically speaking about uh, what Jesus would do when he would walk the face of this earth, or his three years of ministry when he will heal uh, the sick people. Uh, so the, the prophecy that Isaiah gives in Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5, is not just limited to uh, Jesus healing this demon-possessed man, where uh, Matthew says this has come, this prophecy has come into, uh, uh, you know, uh, fulfillment, or it's not just specifically talking about, uh, uh, you know, that this prophecy will be fulfilled only during uh, Jesus' time when he healed the multitudes of their sicknesses and infirmities. But uh, the context in which um, uh, Isaiah is writing in Isaiah chapter 53 is that, you know, um, what Jesus would accomplish on the cross when he, ta when he uh, takes our uh, sicknesses and our infirmities and our diseases is, uh, you know, what he's doing along with bearing our sins is, uh, would, you know, would actually benefit not just a few people like the demon possessed or others who were healed during Jesus' time, but it is for the entire human race. All of us, you know, by Christ's substitutionary suffering, when he took our sicknesses, he took our pain, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's meant not just for the time uh, when Jesus was here on the earth, or not just for that demon-possessed man, but it was is for everyone uh, you know, in the generations to come, in our generation and the generations to come, okay? So what are the implications of the Holy Spirit actually uh, getting uh, Matthew to quote Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 and 5, is we can draw two conclusions here. The first one is that, you know, when Christ bore our sicknesses and our pain on the cross, it means that all of us in any generation, you know, any time span uh, would experience healing and wholeness in their bodies, okay? So just like, uh, you know, the demon-possessed man was healed, was made whole, just like 
like uh, we read in in the gospels in uh, in the book of acts all of them received their total healing and wholeness we too can experience that healing and wholeness because of what christ has done on the cross and the second implication or the second conclusion that we can draw from what isaiah prophesies in uh, in isaiah chapter 53 is that even as we minister healing and deliverance just like christ ministered healing and deliverance and he brought total healing and wholeness to people and even the early church the apostles as we read in the book of acts they, when uh, they prayed for sickness and disease and healing, uh, you know, we see instantly people were healed and made whole. Uh, we can also walk in this truth or we can also believe this, that when we minister healing and deliverance to people, that they can be healed, they can be delivered, they can be restored to perfect wholeness because of what Christ has done on the cross. Okay? So... What Isaiah is prophesying in Isaiah 53 is, uh, you know, is not just for a few select people during Jesus' time or the early church, but it is for our time, our generation, and for the generations to uh, come. So enjoy this blessing, receive this blessing, and just walk in this truth that, you know, even as Jesus bore our sickness and pain, that we can also experience healing and wholeness in our bodies. And even when we, uh, when you step out and pray and minister for healing and deliverance for two people and praying for people, just believe that they too can be healed and made whole, just like uh, Jesus did, because Jesus said we can do greater things than what he has done. And also like what the early church, the early apostles, the early believers, the early church did. Amen. Uh, any questions so far? Any doubts? Okay, just two more things about Christ's substitutionary suffering, that he became a curse for us. We already looked at Galatians chapter 3. Uh, I think we studied it in chapter 7, uh, you know, uh, where we understood uh, what is the implication of Christ taking on uh, the curse, our curse, and he, what it means when he redeemed us from the curse of the law. Uh, we've already discussed this in chapter 7, uh, but uh, let's look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Can somebody read that, please? Galatians 3, verse 13. Christ has <coughs> redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Amen. Thank you, Sanjay. So here we look at another implication of this verse that we already studied in chapter 7, that Christ set us free from the curse of the law, which means uh, the law, you know, when you don't keep the law, it brought certain curses. And the curses were listed out in, um, uh, God listed, uh, listed it out for the Israelites. We read this in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 to 68. A whole list of curses and the curses included, uh, you know, sickness and pain and suffering and every kind of oppression and disease and poverty and failure. It also lists out uh, the blessings. Uh, so when Christ on the cross took our curse, you know, he became uh, a curse for us. He took on our curse so that we can enjoy the blessings. So, you know, don't believe this lie that, uh, you know, the curses are the first past curses in your generations are still operative. Uh, if the thought comes to your mind, you can just, uh, you know, bring that and cover it under the blood of the Lamb and uh, just uh, declare that you are curse-free, that Christ has taken all of your sickness, your failure, your diseases, your poverty, your oppression, and, you know, and you now receive the uh, blessings. So Christ set us free from all the curses of the law, and we receive his uh, blessings that he has for us, so divine exchange again. Yes, Sister Gertrude? Sister, I wanted to ask you, is uh, those who are not born again, your family members, mm -hmm. are they uh, under the curse of the generational curses? 
Yes, because they're still in sin, um, the curse can be operative because they are no longer under the spiritual covering. They're no longer under. They're not coming under what Christ has done for them. So uh, yes, the curse can be operative. They can live under the fear of that curse. That curse can, you know, work in their lives. But sister, yes. if we pray for them, uh, will the prayers be effective? Yes, you can pray for them, but you need to also tell them, you know, uh, uh, and, you know, get them to understand. And it's a good uh, place where you can lead them into salvation. Okay, sister. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll end class here. Um, thank you for those of you who responded from, uh, to my uh, request of having uh, the assessment on... Uh, uh, on March 22nd, I think only six of you have uh, commented on it. If the rest of you can, it will be very helpful. Um, thank you all for uh, joining class today. Have uh, a blessed day and a blessed and refreshing, uh, restful weekend. And I'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you, everyone.